Welcome to the Enrichment Hour and to all of you who are watching on BVTV. I'm Betsy Hall and I'm representing the Enrichment Hour Committee this evening. Tonight, Dr. Lynn Nasman will discuss the convergence of the worlds of music and computers. Lynn likes to remind folks that he's not a medical doctor, but he does spend time healing computers. <laughs> PCs, that is, not Macs. Lynn received his PhD in vocational technical education from Colorado State University, although his undergraduate degrees were in drafting and design, and later in math and engineering. Lynn and his wife Diana have lived in Bristol Village for 16 years. They've been married 60 years, although Lynn says it only feels like 59. <laughs> After working for Ball Brothers Aerospace, Lynn decided to try teaching and found teaching and writing instructional materials were his real passion. He taught at Colorado State University, North Texas State, and for many years at OSU. For years, Lynn has used computers to create music. The before and after music and pictures seen on BVTV before Vespers were his creation. Please welcome Lynn Nasman. First, a word about my music background. When I was about a year old, uh, my grandma Swanson had a stroke. And so my parents decided to rent out their own house and move with my sister and I in with Grandma Swanson. And in the early 1900s, my mother's older brother, she had five brothers, her older brothers got together, pooled their resources, and purchased for Grandma Swanson a Waldorf Upright Grand Player Piano. And you see my sister sitting in front of that. How many of you had player pianos in your families back in those days or before those days? This piano was in the family for a better part of 100 years. Well, if you peek inside one of these pianos, you'll see that uh, there is a, well, it's vacuum powered actually. You pump on the bellows and create a vacuum. And uh, up here is a five valve vacuum motor. And that turns a crankshaft, which pulls, which turns some pulleys, which pull belts and chains and, and drag this piano roll across what I'm gonna call as a sound bar. And the sound bar has a hole for every note on the piano. And there are little pneumatic tubes that go from the sound bar to every one of these notes. Uh, insert player piano video here, it says. Okay, I will try to do that. Clip number one. And here you see a player piano cranking away. And uh, I, I chose this video because the, it shows the piano roll with kind of translucent paper. And so you can see the holes in the paper and you can see the holes on the soundboard behind there. And whenever there's a hole in the paper, it plunks that key on the piano. Well, some of the piano rolls had words printed on them. And if you could look over somebody's shoulder real close, you have to watch. Whenever the word crosses the bar, you sing it. Probably too far away for you to read. Otherwise, you'd all be singing, right? Strutter's ball was quite a thing in its day. Now, the title of my program is Computers and Music, and so some of you are wondering, why is he talking about Grandma Swanson's player piano? Uh, what's that got to do with anything? Well, it turns out that Grandma Swanson's Waldorf Upright Grand Pier 
uh, player piano was actually a digital, pneumatic digital computer. And digital uh, is zeros and ones. There's a switch on or off, there's a hole there or not. And the storage media for this digital computer was a paper piano roll. And it turns out that some of the ver very first computers used the exact same technology. There's a paper tape that gets pulled across a reader. And this particular paper tape has eight possible holes in every data roll. Okay. And uh, you see there are different patterns of holes here. And there are sprocket holes, so drive that thing through. And to know what those holes mean, you need your Lone Ranger secret decoder ring or the, or the equivalent of that. Uh, you need the ASCII binary character table. And so, oops, back up, previous. I'm, I'm bumping the mouse when I shouldn't. Um, so in the ASCII character table, you'll see that the lowercase letter A has a decimal equivalent of 97. But in binary, it's 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. <laughs> the uppercase letter A is 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. Every character, not only the alphabet, but the numbers and punctuation marks and all kinds of other things have a code, have a binary code. And the computer is not as smart as you. You can count to 10. <laughs> we have a visitor just came through. <laughs> I, I don't think he'll join the party. That's OK. Uh, the, you're, you're smarter than a computer because you can count to 10. Computer can only count to 1. <laughs> and has to put a 0 and start again. Uh, you go all the way up to 9 before you add a 0 and start again. So. We have this binary code that the computers can read, and we feed that into the computer. In the early computers, this is, how you, oh, this is how you loaded the operating system. The operating system is something like Windows or Mac or Linux. This is how the early computers, digital computers, loaded the operating system. You got a roll of paper tape with a pattern of holes, fed it in there, and by reading those holes, that computer learned how to operate. And they eventually found ways with magnetic tape to store zeros and ones. Put a real finely grained film of iron powder on that magnetic tape, and the little spots were either magnetized or they were not magnetized. Zeros and ones, binary, digital. So when I was four or five years old, uh, I was fascinated by Grandma Swanson's digital computer. Uh, we had a whole cabinet full of piano rolls, and uh, these things went back to, well, even before World War I, but there were a piano roll. I can remember, Jim, Jim, I always knew that you'd win, or what we're going to do to Kaiser Bill. Uh, so there were some old timers there. But then there were some more popular ones, like Hortense. Anybody remember Hortense? Oh, bunch of kids in here. <laughs> Oh, my sweet Hortense, she ain't good looking, but she's got good sense. Before I kiss Hortense, I always buy a nickel's worth of peppermints. <laughs> How about Barney Google? You remember Barney Google? Oh, yeah. Barney Google with his goo goo googly eyes. Barney Google bet his horse would win the prize. When the horses ran that day, spark plug ran the other way. Barney Google with his goo goo googly eyes. Well, so what I would do is I would select from this marvelous collection of piano rolls, climb up on the piano bench, load the roll, but my legs weren't long enough to pump the pedals. So I had to crawl under the piano bench <laughs> and uh, play the piano roll. And I actually did this. And so I was fascinated by this digital computer. Um, now my sister, ah, 
Everybody knows this one. My sister took piano lessons for a better part of seven years. She was seven years older than me by coincidence. When I came along, for some reason, my parents didn't see fit to have me take piano lessons. But in the piano bench, I discovered the John Thompson Modern Course for the Piano. And a lot of you went through that, right? But even better for me was inside the piano bench, a thin piece of cardboard like an accordion. You could unfold it and you could stick it behind the keys and it told you the name of all the keys on the piano and it told you where on the staff that note was. And this is how I actually learned how to read music, having never taken any lessons. Now, I used to have music running around in my head and uh, that can be a problem. So I've got this music in my head and I can't play any instruments. So how, how can I get this music out of my head so that other people can hear it? The question is, if you can't play an instrument, how can you get music from inside your head out to the world? And the answer is, you already guessed, computer music. Okay, so now we, we have to have a computer to help us with this. And back around 1961, some folks at IBM, I hope they did this in their spare time, but they, they got a hold of this IBM 7094 mainframe computer, and they figured out how to have it make sounds, a little bit of music. They also figured out how to do voice synthesis. Okay, I'm gonna enter the next video here. Play. Nineteen sixty one computer music. Well, I don't think very many symphony orchestra members felt threatened by that. <laughs> and the problem was in 1961, I would have liked to have one of these things, but the price is $3 million for an IBM 7094. Actually, in today's money, that'd be about $20 million. So I wasn't quite ready to try to do computer music yet. In the meantime, oh, I digress. We t I talked about the digital computer and the digital piano player. There's also, in the early days, people were making analog computers as well as digital computers. I'm, what's the difference between analog and digital? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> so analog signals are continuous, okay? There's no gaps, just any place you want. Digital signals are discrete. Think of it this way. Analog, be a nice ramp. You can go any place you want in the elevation on this analog side. Digital side, nope, you can only go on individual steps. So, by the way, uh, did you know that the Bible favors digital over analog? Really? Prove that. Okay, I will. Let me just go on the internet here. Open up my Firefox web browser to my Computer Club homepage. And I've got some handy web links. I'm just gonna go down here and go to the Bible Gateway page and type a keyword in here. Um, let's see what keyword should I do for this purpose. Um, how about L? U K E W A R M. There are two Bible verses for lukewarm. So then, 
the revelations this is. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. So the Bible much prefers digital over analog. <laughs> it must not be lukewarm. Okay, back to the, back to the show. Um, so in the early days, though, there were a lot of people making both digital computers and analog computers. And a guy named Dr. Robert Moog was a, a leader in the analog computer business, and he created the Moog synthesizer, which you could use to create music from an analog computer. Insert switched on block here. Okay. Now, how many of you had a copy of this record, Switched On Bach? Remember that? Switched On Bach was created by a guy named Wendell Carlos, um, I'm sorry, Walter Carlos, who became Wendy Carlos, but let's not think about that story. Anyway, he got a hold of a Moog synthesizer and he programmed it to play different Bach uh, instrumental pieces. Well, in the 1960s, this was a big hit. They sold over a million copies of Switched On Bach. But that was an analog computer. So, now we jumped ahead. In 1961, there was no way I could come up with $2 million to buy a computer. But 20 years later, personal computers came out. And one of my friends in those days offered to build a computer for me because they were coming out as kids. And I said to him, thank you, but no thank you. I'm going to have a personal computer, I said. But I will have a personal computer when it has multiple voice music capabilities. And most of the personal computers did not. But the Atari 800 did. And the Atari 800 came out of the background of the early video games. Remember the Pong game? Yeah. As a matter of fact, a lot of these computers early on used the regular TV set. And the, the salespeople would set up a Pong game in the showroom in the front window. People would walk by and see that thing playing, playing there 24 hours a day. And then when they turned it off, the playing field of that Pong game was burned into the front of the TV set. Oops. <laughs> As a result, the clever designers invented something called a screensaver. So when the computer was inactive for a while, it kept flashing different things on the screen so it wouldn't burn into the screen. And even though we're not using those old tube type picture tubes anymore, we still have uh, screensavers in the, in the uh, computers. Well, the Atari came out of the game business and, and the Pong game, you'd go get a cartridge and plug in your game machine. Well, you open a hatch on the Atari 800, and there are some places to plug in your game cartridges. The cartridge that happens to be plugged in right there, you can't see, but that's a cartridge that allows you to program this computer using the basic computer programming language. But more exciting than that, they came out, Atari came out with a music composer cartridge. Now, in the early 1980s, there were three magazines dedicated to personal computers. There was personal computing, and they focused on things like computer chess playing and those kind of things. Then there was Byte magazine, and that was what the techies got. The, the real nerds got in, and they wanted to know about how to write zeros and ones in machine language and how to build these things. But in between was a magazine called Creative Computing, and Creative Computing in January 1981 had a column for the Apple computer, the Commodore PET, the TRS-80 from Radio Shack, and the Atari computer. Those were the four competitors in 1981. Ah, but they had an article about the Atari music composer. Ooh, and guess what? There was an article by guess who? <laughs> okay, and I said, do you hear music inside your head? but can't play an instrument well enough to get it out? Well, Atari has put together a tool for all you budding Beethovens that makes musical composition easy 
to create, modify, and play. The music composer cartridge simply plugs into an Atari 800 or 400 ROM slot and allows a user to create, rearrange, play, and save up to four-part harmony. Ah, so now we're getting into being able to do computer music finally. Uh, digression. Uh, ROM cartridge, R-O-M. Uh, side, side note, R-O-M is read-only memory. That's memory programs that are burned into the chips in the factory and nobody can change them. R-A-M, random access memory, is memory that is completely fluid and that's what's in your computer today. A lot of RAM, the more the better. Random access memory. End of digression. In the meantime, <laughs> in the meantime, there were uh, some companies starting to make digital synthesizers. Here's a early Casio PT-1. Has a little keyboard, has some switches here where you can choose to play with different sounds. It even has built in some, a couple of different rhythms that you could play against. And, and when you played, it sounded like this. Well, other companies jumped in into the bad wagon because they saw there was going to be a market here. So here is uh, Yamaha's introduction to a synthesizer. Now if we can only get that cat <laughs> off of the, the piano bench there. <laughs> the guy can do a demonstration for you. Go away, kitty, go away. So the keyboard's grown a little bigger. More different instruments to choose. Still a background track that you can use. Just reach up there when you want to change your instruments. So now we're a step ahead in the uh, music synthesizers. Once again, if you were a member of a symphony orchestra, you looked at that and you kind of chuckle and say, yeah, right. Um, however, they got more and more sophisticated and big variety of these synthesizers of all shapes and sizes. And, and the trouble is they, most of them weren't compatible with each other. And so what happened, which was fairly unusual in the capitalistic world, is the, the companies got together and they created something called MIDI, Music Industry Digital Interface. And they all agreed to use the same standards. So the same kind of connectors, no matter what synthesizer they were building, and the same basic collection of instruments. Um, there are basically 128 instruments in the general MIDI set. So whether you bought a Yamaha or Casio or whatever, if you chose instrument number one, you're going to get an acoustic piano. If you chose instrument number 49, you get a string ensemble. Choose instrument number 124, you get a bird tweeting. Or how about 128, gunshot. No matter, uh, whatever synthesizer you get, it had those instruments. And as the computers decided to get into this, most computer companies started building this general MIDI instrument set and connection capability into the personal computers. So, let me find an example of a MIDI file, a data file in the MIDI format. Oh wait, go here, push the wrong button. Um, switch over to my MIDI folder. And if you don't know, you should know that everything in a computer is stored as a file. And every file has a format and there's a three letter extension at the end of the name. Dot DOC means that's a document. So no matter what word processing software, you can probably open that document. Or JPG, a photograph. Or MID. And so if you find a file 
that has MID, we can open that with the Windows Media Player. And it turns out that if you get online and search for free MIDI files, you'll find all kinds of things. If you're interested in hymns, here's a collection of hymns in the MIDI file format. And this is just one collection from the uh, LDS Church. You can find them for the Lutheran hymnal, the Methodist hymnal, and so on. Um, that particular file was uh, playing with a piano, instrument number one. But the MIDI file format has all kinds of possible instruments. So let's try this one. Go over here and open that with Windows Media Player. Of course, the instruments are, are selected by whoever made that MIDI file, but you can call up MIDI files and play them back. So, music synthesizers have gotten very sophisticated with amazing playback capabilities. Insert video here, it says. Okay, gotta go back to my video folder. And let's play this one. Now, let me know you, oops, let me let you know what's going on here. This is a very high-end music synthesizer. Uh, has a couple of keyboards. If you look down below, you'll see it has pedals, just like an organ. Has all kinds of instrument selections. And we have this young Japanese girl here. Uh, she's going to play the soundtrack to the movie Star Wars. Okay, well, we need to set the scene here a little bit first. Uh, get, get ready, come on, let's get these fingers ready. Okay, we have a little bit of a uh, Starship Enterprise sound effects to, to lead off with here. Here comes the spaceship. ahead here in this sample a little bit uh, if I can find the spot uh, somewhere around here this is about where in the movie the uh, X-wing fighters come out and attack the Death Star <laughs> On with John Williams' score.
So, remember those symphony orchestra people that laughed at the Casio? Aha, uh -huh, not so much. By the way, if we pull the cover off of the organ over here in the corner, that organ is pretty much capable of doing everything that this Japanese girl demonstrated. If you pull the back cover off of the organ and peek in, you will see a big metal box that has a whole bunch of connectors that look just like the connectors on the back of a desktop computer. And when you start it up, if you watch the little display, you'll see that it loads the Linux operating system. Operating systems are like Mac operating systems or Windows operating systems or Linux is an alternative operating system. Matter of fact, people that have old Windows computers that are not good anymore, they bring them in, I'll install Linux. The point is, Whenever you see somebody playing our organ, you're seeing the conversion of the world of music and the world of computers. Okay, on with the show. Now, let's talk about this MIDI business just a little bit more. We'll talk about the connections. Since the connections are standardized, it, you could have a computer program here and connect a MIDI keyboard to it, and with the right software, you could play on the keyboard and record what you've played. And once you've recorded it, you can play it back. Or you could get into some music scoring software and edit it and mess with it. If you don't like the instrument sounds, whoops, went backwards again. If you don't like the instrument sounds uh, in your keyboard, there are external sound modules that have samples like the, the technicians have gone and sampled cathedral organs in Europe. They've sampled Yamaha grand pianos. They've sampled Steinway grand pianos. And so the sounds that are available now in the MIDI set go beyond that original 128 sound set. You can get some very serious sounds. Also, if you've been to some of the, the Broadway show series down in Portsmouth, and you've peeked over the rail down into the booth at the orchestra, the chances are that you will see somebody there with at least one keyboard. And uh, because it, maybe they need to fill in for the flute player, maybe they need to have some sound effects, shoot a rifle now and then or whatever, or play an organ. All of this can be done with the MIDI Set, uh, set of standards. Okay, now let's talk about scoring software. Scoring software is used to create, edit, print, and play music scores. And there are several that have been very popular. One of them is called Finale. Right now, you can buy a copy of Finale for about 299 bucks. Um, a few years ago, that would have been four or 500 bucks. The competition has pulled the prices down some. How many of you remember um, our famous trumpet player, Gordon Matthey? He was a resident here for a long time, a retired music professor. He was involved with, at one time, with the Detroit, Detroit Symphony. He played in the pits in a lot of shows, Broadway shows. He was involved in establishing the Canadian Brass Group. And uh, as a professor, he became very famous in the music education business as well. After he retired to Bristol Village, some of his friends would send him music scores in finale. He would open them up, print them out, and sometimes you'd see him in the library sitting there with a music score, editing it, correcting it, and then sending the finale file back. So professional strength editing software, finale. Another one is uh, Sibelius. Uh, I got into Sibelius early on, and it was my favorite for a long time. The trouble is, uh, eventually they sold out to another company, and they've decided to go to not a price to buy the software, but a subscription. And I hate these subscription softwares. Pay $199 a year at the end of the year, 
you don't have the software anymore. But Sibelius is a very sophisticated software. If you're on a beer budget, there's a program for $49 called Noteworthy. And a lot of small churches got into Noteworthy because they could afford it and they could have it play their hymns. You heard the MIDI file playing a hymn a little while ago. And uh, so if you're at Pumpkin Patch, Ohio, one Sunday morning and the uh, organist doesn't show up, open up your computer, run Noteworthy, and play the hymns of the day. The other one I want to spend a little more time talking about is called MuseScore. It's been around for a while, and they keep improving it. MuseScore version 4 is now out, and it's very sophisticated, competitive with Finale and Sibelius, but it's free. Amazing. Such a bargain. Let me uh, open up MuseScore here. Uh, let's see, let me go back to my MIDI folder. It turns out that uh, in your computer, all these files have a three-letter extension which tells the computer what application program is associated with each kind of file. And you can adjust it because there may be more than one program that can open the same kind of files. Well, I've set Louie so that whenever I double-click on a MIDI file, he will open up MuseScore. And then the uh, score will come up. And of course, what comes up is kind of potluck if you're downloading free MIDI files. In this case, somebody's programmed this with uh, pianos for soprano, and they didn't bother labeling alto or bass, but uh, we can play this, see what it sounds like. The thing is, uh, once you have this MIDI file in MuseScore, you have the power to mess with it. You can edit it. For example, maybe you'd rather have the organ playing this instead of the piano. Just click on the instruments over here and say, replace this instrument with an organ. Okay, done. Now when I rewind, got an organ playing the top two staffs. Maybe the folks in your congregation uh, have a hard time hitting that D. It's a, it's, it's a little too high for them, right? So once you have it in a program like MuseScore, I have to do double things here. I have to hold the whole control key down and press the letter A. Control. And that selects everything just like in word processing. Now I'm going to go to my tools, select transpose, and I think I'll transpose it by interval down. Oh, how about a major second? Okay, done. And so once you have these MIDI files imported into a program like MuseScore, you have the power to mess with them, change the instruments, uh, change the arrangement, copy and paste, uh, transpose, do all kinds of things. There are lots of instruments available. And uh, MuseScore, when you install MuseScore 4, you have the option of installing a whole set of instruments that are a little better sounding than probably the ones that came with your computer. So that's a nice feature. Um, whoops, cancel that. We can get into uh, different palettes. Uh, if I want to mess with key signatures, there's all kinds of things you can get into, accidentals and so on. So the natural question is, what if you want to write your own music? Okay, let's go here and say File, New, and it's loading a new score. And MuseScore comes with a whole bunch of templates to choose from. Uh, there are choral templates. You can start out with SATB in organ or SATB in piano, etc. 
Maybe you want chamber music, maybe you want jazz, uh, maybe a jazz combo or a big band combo, or how about uh, just popular songs, bluegrass band, um, we have a template for it. Um, but I didn't want to do that one. I got mouse nerves here. Don't save that. Come back here and let's make another new one. <laughs> And let's just use a single treble clef in our new score. So will say next. Now we get to choose the key that we want. How about um, F major? Okay, time signature, 3-4. You get to choose tempo. Um, default is 32 measures. I think I'll just put eight measures in this little thing. And I'm done. So here's my new score. Um, so how do you get the notes in, you might ask. I knew you were going to ask that. So <laughs> what you do is you, you choose the um, particular kind of note you want to put in here, and you can use your mouse and drop it right there. Drop another one here. Or there's an alternative. You can hit the letter F to add an F, or a G, or an A, or a C. Um, and there's one other alternative. If I press letter P, I get this little piano keyboard, and so I can enter notes directly from the piano. So, with a lot of patience, and there's all kinds of things you can do as far as editing, but with a lot of patience, you can get in here and you can create your own score. A number of years ago, I was sitting around one night and uh, found myself in kind of a country ballad sort of mood. And so, uh, let's go back over here. Let me go to my file of new score files. Open that folder. And here's what I came up with one, some, one evening a while back. Let me turn off the piano thing here. And it takes a minute to load. I'm going to rewind, and then I'll play the score. <clears throat> I could enlarge it so you can see the words, but if I do that, you'll see when I miss, miss a word or two. Little harmonica. <laughs> I promise to be true 
And our love is sure to last forever. Yes, our love forever will be true. So with a little effort, uh, you can open up MuseScore. It's for free. It's available for Mac, Linux, and Windows. And you can start composing your own music. You can get that stuff out of your head into the computer and play it. Well, I'd like to do just one more. Time's running out. Do one for more for you. Um, a lot of times I'll find scores that are written, especially guys like Andrew Lloyd Webber likes to do this. They write them for high tenors or contra tenors sometimes, and it doesn't lend itself to me singing. But you know the trick already, right? If I can get that file into MuseScore, I can transpose it. And I'm going to try to do that now for you. <coughs> granted me a son. The summers die one by one. How soon they fly on and on. And I am old and will be gone. Bring him gives you an idea how music, the world of music, and the world of computers have come together. And neither could live without the other these days. I'm sure you've gone to concerts where those symphony orchestra players don't have any music in front of them, no sheet music in front of them. They have a tablet. And a tablet is showing their music. And they tap their toe on a little button and it turns the page for them. Um, and as you've seen, 
Our organ here really has converged the world of music and the world of computers. What do you think Bach would think of this? Bach would have loved it. Remember those old organs and you look at the stops? There's the stops for trumpets, stops for violins, and even more than 100 years ago, they were trying to do what the synthesizers can do today with computers. So that's my soapbox speech on computers and music. Thank you very much.